deliberate in my emphasis. Write them. Meditate on them. Let these things become real. It will be the substance and the foundation of your faith. Jesus was speaking in Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13. The Bible said he took his disciples to the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, and he asked his disciples saying, who do men say, I, the son of man, I am? And to your dismay, because Jesus was not surprised. <laughs> but to my own dismay, I realized all the schools of thought did not have an accurate revelation of the person of Christ. The Bible said, when reports were coming from the schools of thought, it said, some said you are John the Baptist. Others said you are Elias. Others said you are Jeremiah. And others said you are one of the prophets. So they didn't know who the master was. And because they had no revelation of who he was, the church of God could not be established on the face of the earth. Because when the church is born, the gate of hell will come. And if there's no accurate revelation, there will be no foundation for the church. So Jesus turned to his disciples. Maybe they didn't get the message of the prophets correctly, but you have been with me. Who do you say I, the son of man, I am? And again, nobody knew. Until Peter spoke by the Spirit. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. That means it came to him at that moment. It was not a knowledge he was running with. It was a disclosure that was given to him at that moment. And quickly, Jesus capitalized on the moment. And he said, upon this revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so the foundation of our faith is the revelation of the person of Christ and his works. And like I have taught you here before, there are, three, there are four major dimensions of the revelation of the person of Jesus. The embodiment of that revelation is encapsulated within four major headlines. The first is the revelation of him as God the Son. The second is the revelation of him as the Son of God. The third is the revelation of him as Son of Man. And the fourth is the revelation of him as the Christ or the Messiah. If you don't know Jesus within these four contexts, you don't know his person. This is why the schools of thought considered him to be one of the prophets. Because they didn't know that he was God the Son. That's the first revelation of him that you must have. But regrettably, up to this day, many in the world, including Christians, don't know that he is God. As God the Son, like I have taught here many times, he is co-equal with the Father and the Spirit. He is co-equal. He is co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit. And he is co-existent with the Father and the Spirit. What that means is that there has never been a time and there will never be a time when the Father will exist and the Spirit will exist and Jesus will not exist. None is older than the other. They have always been and they will always be. What that also means is that the Father is not greater than the Son. Neither is the Son greater than the Spirit. They are eternally co-equal. And that also means the Father cannot exist apart from the Son. Neither can the Spirit exist apart from the Son. Although three forms, they exist essentially as one entity. If you don't know Jesus in that light, you have not known him. And you cannot be an agent of the kingdom. You must know 
that he is God the Son. Glory to God. And scriptures affirms this. Jesus himself speaking, he called himself God. In John chapter 4, chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and he said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. The next verse, the Bible said they took stones to stone him because they knew what he was saying. In Exodus 3.14, God introduced himself as the I am that I am. So Jesus didn't say before Abraham was, I was. It's not a linguistic thing. It's an essential reality he was defining. And the Jews knew what he said. So they took up stones to stone him because he was calling himself God. In fact, in John 10, 30, Jesus speaking again, he said, I and the Father are one. In John 14, verse 9, he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So many times in scripture, for those who had spiritual understanding, Jesus called himself God. And all the prophets knew that he was God. That's why they called him the Messiah. The messenger of God that was coming. But he was not like any of the errands. Errand runners. Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1 said, God who had sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in this last day spoken unto us by his son. His son is not one of the prophets. His son, he said, he appointed him heir of all things and by whom he made the world. So his son is the creator of the world. And he said, who been the brightness of his glory? The express image. So every prophet that spoke about the Messiah knew that it was the creator that was coming. He was the creator of all things. They knew also that he was the visible expression of God. And they also knew that he was the carrier of his glory. So this is not one of the prophets. This is why Isaiah was speaking. In Isaiah 7, 14, he said, unto us a child is born. He said, a virgin shall give birth. I give you a sign. The Lord himself gives you a sign. He said, a virgin shall give birth. And he shall bear, conceive, and give birth to a son. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. What is Emmanuel? Emmanuel means God is with us. So all the prophets that prophesied about the Messiah knew it was God himself that was coming. In fact, Isaiah went further in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. When he reiterated this, see what he said about him. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He said the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Number three, what? Mighty God. No prophet is called mighty God. Number four, he said he shall be called what? The everlasting father. So every prophet knew that the one coming was God. He wasn't one of the prophets. And not only the prophets, all the apostles knew that Jesus was God. In John chapter 1 verse 1, he said in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. That was John speaking. Every apostle knew that Jesus was God. Paul was speaking. Now, in verse 14 of this same scripture, John said, and that word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. So they knew that the word was God and the word, which is God, was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. So John knew that Jesus is God. And he was not the only one. First Timothy 3.16, Paul was speaking. He said, great, without any controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. He said, God was manifested where? In the flesh. Every apostle knew that Jesus was God. So when they preached him, fundamentally, they preached him as God. Because they knew who he was. Only those who don't have spiritual knowledge think that is a prophet is greater than a prophet. He is God in human form. And I have told you here before, the reason you hear some scriptures like Jesus speaking said, my father is greater than I, is because of administration. I've explained that to you before. And that's where you come into son of God. As God the son, he is co-equal with the father. But as son of God, 
he was running an errand, a project of the Godhead. Because when you study God, you will discover that essentially God is one. But existentially, God manifests in three forms. Before creation, before anything was created, God was. That's why I said in the beginning was the world. In that form, God was not an existential being. He was just essentially God. In that state, God is one. But for the purpose of God's administration, when he created the world, he had to manifest in three forms. So there is the manifestation of God and there is the essence of God. So Jesus essentially is God. But in manifestation, he is one of the three persons of the Godhead. And the Bible makes this easy for us to understand. In Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, it said in case you don't understand the mystery of the Godhead, he said look at nature. Nature has a simplistic way of interpreting it to you. So he said, for the invincible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that no man is without excuse. So God is telling us, even if you can't understand it doctrinally, he said nature is an interpreter of the essence of the Godhead. So you can understand the Godhead from nature. That's why I use the example of water when I was explaining the Godhead. I told us that chemically speaking, which is the essential nature of water, water is H2O. Two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. But manifestly, which is the physical expression of water, water exists in three forms. As liquid, as solid, and as gas. You call it ice, water, and steam. Now, ice is equal with water. Water is equal with steam. Ice is not greater than water. Neither is water greater than steam. And ice is water. Steam is water. The liquid is also water. So God, outside manifestation, is essentially one being called God. But in manifestation, it takes three forms. Water is not ice. Ice is not steam. But ice, water, and steam is water. So Jesus is not the Father. The Father is not the Spirit. But both Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit is God. So they are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent. However, when God wanted to save man, when God came into the business of creation, God needed an administrative system. Because if God steps into creation in his fullness, creation can't contain him. Because if creation contains God, God will stop being God. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. So what did God do? He decided to step down his reality and encase himself in a flesh so that that flesh can carry out specific program for God. Now, because of that administration, the God that is in the flesh cannot function like the God outside of creation. Because if he functions like that, creation can't contain him. So he humbled himself, relinquished his dimensions so that he can carry out his own administration. It is in that light that Jesus said, my father is greater than I. Not because he's bigger than me essentially, but right now there is a God program. And I have come to fulfill that program. So I have stepped down from operating in the fullness of God. So that I can carry out that program. Are you following this? So when Jesus said, the father is greater than I. He wasn't contradicting himself. He was actually opening our eyes to a program. Because if God exists in his fullness, how can God die for sin? It will be impossible. If God exists in his fullness, how can God be man? So God decided to step himself down so that he can run a program. So when Jesus was on the earth, they gave him one name and they said that name is Jesus and it means salvation. So Jesus was running only one program, salvation. So because of that, he couldn't do the other things that he would have done as God. But when the program of salvation was over, 
while he was on the cross, he talked to the Father. Now I'm about to come to you. Restore to me the glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world. So when he was running the errand of God, he was son of God. After that errand is over, he returns back to heaven as God the son. If you meet Jesus now and you call him son of God, you are wrong. He has become God the son again because the program is over. And that's why the moment he resurrected, glory changed. John saw him in the Isle of Patmos. He had to reintroduce himself. Because the person he saw in Galilee is not the one he's seeing now. He said, I am Alpha Omega. Alpha Omega is not son of God. Alpha Omega is God the son. I am the one who was, who is, and who is to come. I am the first and the last. That's Jesus introducing himself, but in a new ranking and in a new order. So you need to know God the son. And you need to know son of God. And I told you this is not supposed to be a mystery. People keep arguing that how can God have a son if he's not married? That's dwarf thinking. Because even the lower organisms like Amoeba, they don't marry, they have children. <laughs> you don't need to have a wife to have children. And the way God works is that when a man talks, you hear sound. But when God talks, the voice of God works. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 4, he said the voice of God came walking in the garden so when God talks God can sit on his throne hear this please it's not every errand an angel can run salvation is one of them so there are certain things that God has to do by himself so the way God does it is that like creation no angel can create that's why he said in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth how? he said God said so when God spoke the word went to work. That means the word is not sound. The word is also a person. So when a man talks, you hear sound. But when God talks, God comes out and God starts walking. So the God that spoke is God Father. The one walking is God Son. It doesn't... Uh, 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 Bible said and the earth was void darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of the Lord hovered upon the face of the water and he said and God said light be it's not volume the moment God said it in the beginning was the word the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him so the moment God said light be the word went to work and began to concoct what light is he gathered the elements together and light appeared and the father saw it and it was good so there is God the son and there is son of God God the son is God in his full majesty son of God is God on an errand to do that which only God can do like creation like salvation so two times Jesus came out as son of God was at creation in Genesis chapter 1 and was at Matthew 1 23 when he came for salvation you must know this as a Christian and that's not all you must also know him as son of man he's a son of man that he represents us we didn't have authority in the government of heaven because there were angels there all kinds of beings were there but men were not represented because when Adam fell our seat became vacant that's why the Bible said the sons of God appeared before God. He said Satan came but Job was not there. Because the seat of man was vacant. So God needed man to be represented. So when Jesus finished his work, he ascended to heaven as a man to represent man. So that the quadrant and the dominion that represents man should not be vacant. So in Daniel 7 verse 13 and 14, the Bible said, look at that scripture. He said, I saw in a night vision and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Verse 14, he said, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, all nations, all languages shall serve him. His dominion is from everlasting dominion and it shall never pass away. So the reason we too have a kingdom is because we have the son of man representing us 
So if you go to heaven today, we have a stake in Mount Zion. And because Jesus is now there, the church can also appear. That's why in heaven we are called the church of the firstborn. Because it's representing man there. So that men can have a stake. This is why you too can now exercise authority in heaven. Son of man. And then Christ. He is the Christ. The anointed one and his anointing. That's where he empowers you. Because when you study the word Christ. In the Old Testament. In the Hebrew. is the word Mashiach. And the word Mashiach is empowerment by the anointing. This is why every time kings are ordained, they are Mashiach. Every time prophets are ordained, they are Mashiach. Every time priests are ordained, they are Mashiach. Exodus 30 verse 30. It said, anoint Aaron and his son. Mashiach, Aaron and his son. That they may minister to me in the priest's office. In 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 15. It said, Mashiach Hazael. That he may serve as prince over Syria. And then in verse 16, he said, Mashiach Elisha, that he may serve as prophet in your stead. So when we call Jesus the Christ, he didn't just run the errand of God. He came to bring you and I into the prophetic, into the priesthood, and into the kingship. So because Christ has become your Christ, you have become a king. That's why I said in Revelation 1 6, unto him that washed us and made us kings and priests unto God. Because Christ is your anointing, you now have the right to hear the voice of God. In John 10 27, he said, My sheep heareth my voice. Hearing God is no longer something that a prophet must hear to tell you. If you know the Christ, you too will hear God. Every prophet that come will be a confirmation because your ears too has opened. And you are also a priest so you too can access God's presence. That's why I say come boldly before the throne of grace where you shall obtain mercy, favor in times of need. So Jesus is God the Son, his Son of God, his Son of Man and he is the Christ. If this revelation is not at the foundation of our theology, what we are doing is not church it's social gathering when the devil comes he will blow us away like chaff because it's a son of as god the son that we have one to worship it's a son of god that we are saved and ransomed and it's a son of man that we have a stake in the spirit to exercise dominion and it's as christ that we are raised priests kings and prophets this is what defines who we are and all of that is the revelation of the person of Christ. Sit down for a moment. The second dimension of revelation that the church is built on is the works of Christ. And the works of Christ is also incorporated into the revelations of his person. Because every dimension you know there is a work that he did. But Paul summarized it and gave us the basic in 1 Corinthians 15. From verse 1 to verse 4. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. This is where you stand. The revelation of the works of Christ. Verse 2. He said, By which also you are saved. This is what saved you. He said, If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. What did he preach? Verse 3. For I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So the first layer of the Pauline gospel is that Christ died for you according to the scriptures. Verse 4 it said, And that he was buried and that he rose again from the dead on the third day so this is the simplistic summary of the works of Christ it's a bit broader than this for discipleship purpose because his incarnation is part of his works his sinless life is part of his works his ascension is part of his works his coronation is part of his works but these are the basics that we stand on and by which we are saved he said his death his burial 
and his resurrection. Now, when we talk about the cross, the cross is not a wood. The cross is actually talking about the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. So when we are talking about the message of the cross, we are talking about the message that borders on the substitutionary death of Christ, the significance it holds for the Christian and the expectation that it confess on the Christian. So you must know the message, you must know the significance, and you must know the expectation that is conferred upon you. If you don't know this, then you don't know the cross. And so in the next 30-40 minutes, I want to deal with the message of the cross. And like I have said, it will encompass what? The message, the significance of the message or the implication of the message, and then the demand of the message. Because this is one of the pillars upon which we are standing as Christians. The death of Jesus Christ. Can you pray in the spirit for one minute? Ask the Lord to reveal it to you. These things are so simple that if you are not careful, it will elude you, it will skip you. Yeshua Lion of Judah Yeshua Those of you graduating today, pay attention to me. This is the message you will preach to your generation. And when you preach this message, these are the implications that are born by reason of the message. And while you are yet preaching it, these are the expectations that God has of you. It's called the way of the cross. You know, the message of the cross is the greatest hope of apostolic doctrine. A man is not an apostolic voice, except as the message of the cross is at the center of his teaching. 1 Corinthians 1 18. Hmm. He said, For the preaching of the cross, this is Paul talking, to them that perish is foolishness. He said, But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. He said, But to us who are saved, this is God's power. So if you are looking for God's power, go to the cross. That's where the highest demonstration of the power was demonstrated. Was wrath. The death, then the resurrection. In verse 23 of this scripture, Paul further reiterated. He said, but we preach Christ and him crucified. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. Unto the Greek, foolishness. There are those who are looking for mysticism. So if you are not saying something that is mystical, you can't bless them. And there are those who are scholar. If you are not talking with oratorial prowess, if you are not talking with human wisdom, you can't bless them. Paul said, to those who look for mysticism outside the cross, he says it's a stumbling block. To the scholars, it's foolishness. He said, but unto us, which are called, both Jews and Greek, he said, Christ, that's the message of crucifixion, is the power of God and is the wisdom of God. Chapter 2 from verse 1 to 4. Same emphasis, reiterated. 
Brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He said, for I determined to know, not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Next verse. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Verse 4. He said, my preaching and my teaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. He said, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power. So when your emphasis is Christ crucified, your message becomes a demonstration of spirit and power. You can be talking, the deaf, will op deaf ears will open. You will be talking, drug addicts will be transformed. You will be talking, the blind will see. Tumors will vanish because your speech and your preaching becomes the demonstration of spirit and power. This is the hub of apostolic doctrine. Galatians chapter 3 from verse 1 to 4. Every apostle preached the cross. Oh foolish Galatians. He said, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified amongst you. That means when Paul preached, it looks like a portrait of Jesus crucified. That was the detail of his communication. And Paul was not the only one preaching it. Even Peter preached the cross. 1 Peter 4 verse 1. He even went deeper into the application. He said, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, he said, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. He said, for he that have suffered in the flesh have ceased from sinning. The cross and its application. So if you don't know the message of the cross, you will not see the implication of that message and you will not even know what God expects of you. The summary of my teaching tonight is to advance that message, show you the implications, and then also show you what God expects of you if you have believed and received that message.